Can you hear me, everyone? Can you hear me? We could all take a seat. We can begin. It is a genuine pleasure for me to welcome everyone back. Um, I was talking with some of my colleagues uh, over dinner tonight and realized that the last time that everyone would have stepped foot in this building uh, for one of these uh, speaking events would have been exactly two and a half years ago. Um, that is pretty astounding uh, length of time, over 700 days, 750 days um, we've been apart. So it is, like I said, just a really genuine pleasure to, to see you all, to see people in person, not cooped up in my office um, on Zoom talking to seemingly nobody. Um, for those who maybe are coming here for the first time, uh, my name is Eric Story. I'm the Outreach Manager um, at the Laurier Centre for the Study of Canada. Of course, that is the new name. Um, and also, I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of History here at Wolford Laurier University. Now, of course, as I've been letting many of you know who have been tuning in on Zoom over the past couple of months or even years, we've been slowly renovating this space. I'm sure many of you do not recognize this space um, any longer. It is indeed new, um, lovely everything. And one of the great kind of additions to this space is along the walls, you can see three cameras. And those cameras are actually broadcasting live right now. Um, to those who are not able to tune in uh, here in person. So, of course, I just want to say hi to everybody who is tuning in from, you know, maybe Toronto, but maybe as, as far as Vancouver and in the opposite direction, maybe even Cape Breton Island or Newfoundland. Um, we really, really appreciate you sticking with us um, over the long term, and we hope that we are able to meet your expectations um, in this new hybrid environment. Now, before we begin, of course, I would like to acknowledge that the LCSC, or the Laurier Centre for the Study of Canada, is located on the traditional territories of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples, and we recognize the continuing presence of Indigenous peoples and cultures here, the consequences of the long colonial relationship between the Government of Canada and First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples, are far-reaching and painful. The LCSC is committed to reconciliation through the establishment and maintenance of a mutually respectful relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. Now, all of you are certainly not here to hear me introduce myself and talk about the beautiful renovations to the center, have Zare's donuts and coffee. Of course, you want to hear our speaker. Um, and I will, before I turn it over to our speaker, I would actually like to turn it over to our director, um, who will introduce our speaker tonight and provide you with just a few brief remarks. So I'll turn things over to uh, Dr. Kevin Spooner. Thanks, Eric. So before we begin, I just want to take a couple of minutes uh, this evening to say how very pleased I am to actually have the Center Speaker Series back in the center, physically here at 232 King Street, and as Eric's just said, online as well. We're grateful to the Laurier Faculty of Arts for its support of our initiative to create this hybrid event space so that we can meet both in person uh, and virtually at the same time. As this is our very first attempt to host a hybrid event with our new equipment, I'll ask our online audience in particular to be particularly patient with us as we get used to all the technical ins and outs of managing our events this way. I'm so very grateful to the LCSC team who have worked tirelessly to make tonight happen. So Eric, of course, Eve in our control room over here, uh, Emily, Britt, uh, Matt, uh, thank you very much. I'd also like to take this opportunity to express the center's gratitude to John and Patty Cleghorn. The Cleghorns have been stalwart friends of the center for years and their generosity uh, literally makes everything we do here possible. And that includes this series of speaking um, engagements. We're very saddened to hear that Patty passed away this summer and our thoughts are very much with John and the entire Cleghorn family. Finally, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. Uh, Terry Kopp is our Director Emeritus at the Centre, and for most of this audience, needs no introduction whatsoever. So I'm kind of superfluous up here, I suppose. Still, for the handful of folks who may not be completely familiar with Terry's scholarly work, let me assure you that you are in the best of hands this evening. 
Terry is a foremost scholar of Canada's military history, the leading expert on Canada in the Second World War. A gifted teacher and researcher, he spent decades sharing his wisdom in the classroom, on the battlefields of Europe, at countless public speaking events just like this one, and through his numerous books. Tonight, from Terry, we learn about Montreal in the Great War. Please welcome Terry Culp. <clears throat> well, I can see one or two familiar faces. So for many of you, uh, this is a, a, a revisit to uh, uh, coming here to listen to me talk about some aspect of Canadian military history. And um, I want to say a few introductory comments first before I get going, though I'm going to try tonight to stay um, as close to a 40 minute talk as I possibly can. First thing is I'd like to, in the case John is watching, uh, to express um, my sadness at the passing of Patty Cleghorn, who was a good friend of my wife and I, along with John, as well as a good friend of the Laurier Center. Um, and uh, the continued interest of John in the work of the Center and in Canadian military history uh, is really very impressive. Um, to tell a very small anecdote, John uh, Claghorn, who was, for those of you who don't know, for many years president of the Royal Bank of Canada, was what you might describe as a hard-driving go-getter in most aspects of his life. Uh, and I was uh, spent a day touring uh, the uh, Normandy beachhead with uh, John, Patty, and his children, two of his children. And... Um, Patty and I got together and uh, agreed that we would be back at the hotel in the center of Bayeux by five o'clock so Patty could have a drink and a rest and uh, be sensible. So I delivered them on time and let them off. And only the next day when I picked them up again did I learn that John had used the two hours between five and seven uh, when dinner began in France to... Uh, uh, take them out to places that I had missed on the journey that he had found in the guidebook. So there's some people you can't slow down. Um, the other general thing I would like to say, if again that's permissible, is um, the subject of tonight's talk, the Irish Canadian Rangers in Canada and Ireland, uh, is not of impersonal interest to me. My father was born and raised educated in Dublin born in 1907, and therefore lived through the events that I will be discussing as a young boy and as a young teenager. Uh, his older, the next brother, uh, my dad was the youngest, uh, was uh, um, 12 to my father's eight when the Eastern Rebellion broke out in uh, 1916. And uh, their you're older uh, when the Irish Canadian Rangers arrived in Dublin. I actually uh, tried to get Dougie, my, my uncle, uh, to figure out whether he and my dad had been out on the streets of Dublin to greet the Canadians. And the reason that I asked that is that my their yet older brother, my other uncle, uh, had emigrated to Canada before the war, joined the Canadian Expeditionary Force, but the two boys may not have known that he was actually uh, overseas already uh, in the service corps and not a uh, likely candidate for the Irish Canadian Rangers. Um, I also said, as I said the last time I spoke about this, my older, my own older brother, David, and I have heard different versions from my father of what life was like in Dublin during the course of the rebellion. Uh, I guess that depended on where we were in our evening libations uh, uh, during many years. Well, um, let me begin by talking for a few moments about uh, this poster. Um, I picked this one out particular. There are, as you'll know, many Irish uh, Canadian Ranger posters, but this one stressing all in one and showing the old provinces of Ireland, Ulster, Connaught, Leinster, and Munster, was an attempt on the part of the people organizing the Irish Canadian Rangers 
to try and cross away from religious and regional barriers or Southern Ireland versus Ulster in reality, and to announce that what they were after was to unify uh, the people of Irish Canada, Protestant and Catholic, and hopefully to have some similar influence in Ireland itself. So uh, that is a part of the story which we'll come back to. And uh, what we're going to do next is, uh, all right. Nope. Yeah. What we're going to do next is I've set up with uh, um, Matt Baker, who's the senior uh, person here, uh, to show you some uh, comments. I put up a slide of Montreal at War. Is it working now? That's great. I put up a slide at Montreal at War because I did want to assure you, even if you're not an ex-Montrealer, which I'm sure takes care of most of you, that what the book uses is Montreal as a case study of Canada in the war. And uh, every second chapter is a military chapter about what actually happened on the battlefield. Now, the, the, the case study then breaks down into a specificity of the Montreal battalions, but I don't think that prevents it from being a book that has a lot of new things to say about the Canadian experience of the First World War. So uh, what... I am jinxed. I'm going to give it back to you and I'll look over at you and I want to change this. Oh, I did. oh there it is. Sorry. Well, I'd love to do it myself if I could. What I got um, uh, uh, Matt Baker to do was to show an outline. And this is designed to keep me from straying off track, okay? So the first thing I, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is interrogate, discuss, or if you wish, unpack. I've never been able to handle that word, but what the hell, I've got to learn. Uh, a number of aspects of what I'm looking at and I'm starting with the Montreal Irish, and I'm going to try and keep it simple. Montreal Irish are a little bit peculiar because they are largely second and third generation. That is, they're the descendants of famine migrants who landed in Quebec. Uh, they're the descendants of uh, uh, immigration in the 1850s and 1860s. But Irish immigration is not an important factor in the last quarter of the 19th century and a relatively small part of the massive immigration from the British Isles that occurred uh, during the period before the First World War. Indeed, our residents arrive in Montreal in larger numbers in those periods than Irish Catholics. And when I talk about the Montreal Irish, I'm really talking about the Catholic community unless I specifically mention the Irish Protestants. And that's, of course, because in Montreal, the Irish Protestants assimilated. They have become increasingly indistinguishable from uh, the uh, uh, Scottish community, the Anglo-Scottish or Anglo-Celtic community, as I call it, which is, plays such a large role in the structuring of Montreal. So uh, I just want to keep that relatively clear. Okay, in 1914, we're dealing with a largely second and third generation population um, they are about 10%, however, of the city's population of just under a million, which means there's 80,000 Irish Catholics, many of whom have at least a fond connection with the idea of being Irish, identify themselves as Irish for the census in 1911. The truth of the matter is, though, except for relatively small pockets in what was called Point, what is called Point St. Charles and what was called Griffintown, uh, the Irish have spread uh, widely through the city, and it's increasingly difficult, for example, to identify them with St. Patrick's Cathedral, which is in the heart of downtown Montreal, uh, um, or uh, because there are Irish parishes in various parts of the city, which are English speaking. The other thing that has to be said about them is they're in a rather curious position because there's no large scale Italian immigration yet. There are Italians, but they're 2% of the population. Um, and they, the Irish therefore have their own school system, not only their own parish churches, but the, Irish, the English Catholic schools of Montreal are for all practical purposes, Irish schools. And uh, because of their peculiar status, unlike their French Canadian co-religionists, 
they have built their own high schools. Now, I mustn't get dragged into this except to say French Canadians don't have high schools. They have primary school and they have classical college. And they're well aware of the fact that this is a narrowing thing. This produces minimal mass literacy, perhaps, for the population. And uh, the brighter, more promising people of whatever economic background, in many cases, selected by the parish priest will go on to classical college and then to university. Uh, but the Irish Catholics have created their own school system, paralleling the Protestant system, which means everybody can go to McGill University if they have the marks. And McGill is, you know, to put it mildly, the most remarkable university in the country at that time. It's also true that the Irish in Montreal have assimilated at the upper levels pretty thoroughly. The most prominent single businessman in Montreal, most influential and most powerful, is an Irish Roman Catholic from Milwaukee, who's been in Canada for a very long period of time, Thomas Shaughnessy, not yet Lord Shaughnessy, but definitely president of the Canadian Pacific Railway, on the board of governors and chairman at McGill, on the boards of governors of the Bank of Money, you name it, and Shaughnessy is there. And his children, who will become volunteers during the course of the war, uh, and one in the Irish Canadian Rangers and one in another regiment, are also already prominent citizens. And if that isn't enough, the member of parliament for uh, the Irish constituency, so-called St. Anne's, is C.J. Doherty, <coughs> the Minister of Justice in the Borden government, and a former judge and one of, along with uh, Sir Charles Fitzpatrick, the Supreme Court, another Irish Roman Catholic, very much a part of what we'll call the establishment. Indeed, Doherty and Shaughnessy lives on a man, in a mansion in the square mile, uh, but Doherty has long since abandoned St. Anne's Ward for Westmount and lives in a quite handsome place at that part of the city. So we have to be careful now about saying what this is all about. However, what really mattered uh, to the Irish community in Montreal is Flip Trehay, whose picture will come up in a few moments. Now, Harry Flip Trehay, who I must say in 1914 is uh, Henry Trehay QC, a prominent partner in a Montreal law firm, uh, is known to every Irishman as well as most other Anglo Celts in the city of Montreal, because he because he was the captain of the Montreal Shamrocks when they won their two Stanley Cups in 1900 and 1901. And if Montreal is a hockey city today, it was even more a hockey city back at the turn of the century. And Harry, who is credited in the uh, NHL Hall of Fame reports with having done more to advance the cause of the forward pass than any other hockey player. Prior to Harry, it is said that what players did is set the puck to the far end. That sounds a little bit familiar to me, but since there's no blue line. Anyway, uh, they chased the puck, whereas Harry insisted as a center of a high scoring line on passing it back and forth and setting up goals. So Harry is a prominent local citizen, but as far as people are concerned, it really goes back to his role with the Montreal Shamrocks. So the Irish community is, I think, interesting and somewhat coherent, and it's possible for us to talk about it in the way that we're going to. I'm going to switch constantly between uh, the two uh, scenes of Ireland, uh, the Montreal Irish and uh, Ireland itself. I was surprised when I began reading again about Ireland in preparation for this lecture. The population of Ireland in 1914 was down to under 4.4 million. It had collapsed from its pre-famine levels and continued to decline throughout the course of the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, Belfast is a much larger city than Dublin. Uh, the other towns that we think of as important Irish centers are relatively small. Uh, Cork is only about 60,000, which is really hard for me to imagine having been to Ireland on several occasions. Um, the other thing is, is that uh, only 73% of the 40, of the 4.4 million are Roman Catholic. So the Presbyterian Church of Ireland contingent in Ulster and in uh, 
uh, the south of Ireland, uh, are 26% uh, of the population with the balance not attesting to any religion. Very, very small Jewish population, virtually nil immigration from Europe uh, uh, in, uh, in, in Ireland. The other thing that we need to know at this time in 1912-1914 is that um, the Irish Parliamentary Party, which dominates politics in Ireland, which of course is at Westminster in London, that is they've been elected from Irish constituencies, but they sit in London as they have been doing since 1800. What we have instead is a um, movement led by John Redman, the leader of the Irish Parliamentary Party, uh, for home rule. And this would be, we won't go back to Charles Parnell and the Gladstone connection. Uh, this would be the third attempt on the part of the Irish moderates, we'll call them, to achieve home rule for Ireland. And again, in parentheses, home rule isn't very much. It isn't dominion status, which we'll talk about later. It's maybe equivalent to provincial status within the dominion of Canada, in the sense that Britain will continue to control not only defense and foreign policy and all that kind of stuff, but it will have a supervisory role, very much like the attempts to invoke the peace order and good government or other clauses of the Canadian constitution against provinces that are politically weak in Canada. So uh, the promise of, um, of home rule, a uh, limited kind of devolution of power uh, to a parliament in Dublin is what everyone is striving for, not everyone, but the majority, leaving aside a radical Republican group, series of fractured groups. We will think of, we know it as the IRA, but really it is at this stage the IRB, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, which is a secret society, sworn allegiance, committed to a republic, uh, committed to opposition to the Irish Parliamentary Party, but not really a very powerful force uh, in 1914. So it's all about uh, John Redman versus, um, I actually put Willie Redman's picture up for, I'll explain it in a moment, but the Redman brothers, John and Willie, are the dominant figures in the Irish Parliamentary Party at this stage. Oppets uh, is uh, Sir Edward Carson, the leader of Ulster and uh, a long-standing member of parliament from Dublin, from Trinity College, Dublin, the Protestant empire or enclave within the city. And uh, let's uh, be again, very simple. Carson and other leaders in Ulster, which is the six northern counties of Ireland that will become the Ulster you know today, or Northern Ireland if you prefer, have reacted to the Home Rule Bill, even though it offers so little power to the Catholic majority, um, with, a, with a really uh, uh, totally negative aggressive, antagonistic position, which would be familiar throughout the rest of 20th century Irish history. In simple terms, they sign as a deep pledge what is known as the Ulster Covenant. And the Ulster Covenant, which has 400,000 signatures by the end of 1913, is a pledge to resist by any means necessary, that's a quote, the possibility of being ruled by an Irish parliament in Dublin. And they double down by importing arms into Ireland, Northern Ireland, uh, organizing the Ulster Volunteer Force, which starts to train with German and Belgian weapons that are brought in. And uh, we are in a situation in Ireland that is really, really quite difficult um, between Ulster and the, uh, and the South. Uh, one last comment and then uh, will uh, let the Irish alone for a little while. Um, the Irish are garrisoned by the British army, even when much of the British army in Ireland is Irish. That is, there are people who've been recruited into Irish regiments, which are part of the British army. Um, but they are, in terms of especially the officer class, overwhelmingly Protestant and overwhelmingly pro-Ulster. And therefore, 
I, I find this fascinating. St. Patrick's Day, 1914, uh, fell on a Sunday. It was a sunny, bright day, and Montreal had the oldest parish. St. Patrick's Day parade in North America, and people turned out very, very large crowds on a sunny March day. And then uh, in typical Montreal weather, it snowed like hell for the next three days. And that mattered because the banquet for the Irish St. Patrick's Society was on the Wednesday. And when they gathered at the Windsor Hotel, the most spectacular hotel in the city, the, um, the life that was experienced was to hear uh, Willie Redman, who was on a tour of the United States to raise money and raised profile of the Irish Parliamentary Party. And Willie had made a special trip from New York in order to come to Montreal and deliver a stirring address. Willie was the emotional one. I may not get to it again, so I just want to say at the age of 55, Willie volunteered to join the uh, Irish 16th Division, the South Irish 16th Division, served as an officer, rose to the rank of major, apparently was very competent, and then was killed at the Battle of Messine Ridge. So a quite extraordinary individual. His brother was the more rational, more powerful uh, person, but the emotional and in some ways inspirational leader of the two was without question Willie Redmond. So um, let me simply say that on the March 20th, when Willie is talking to the Montreal Irish in Ireland, the garrison center is, Cora, is in Corag, and the officers of the British Army in Corag, including who will later become Lieutenant General Herbert Goff, mutiny or have an incident, depending on what you wish to call it, they declare that any officer who is unwilling to coerce Northern Ireland will have the opportunity of resigning. And apparently most of the officers stationed at Karag are on the verge of handing in their papers as a commissioned officer in the King's army uh, in order to avoid any appearance that they themselves might go to Northern Ireland to put down the Ulster volunteers who are arming and drilling and so on and so forth. So it's um, kind of odd that uh, back in Montreal, we're all, they're all celebrating uh, uh, the victory of the Home Rule Movement and in Ireland, they're on the verge of a civil war from March 20th, 1914 on. Well, um, we go back to um, Montreal or Canada, really. It's not very different in, in other parts of Canada than it is here. In Montreal, uh, the news of the outbreak of war in August 1914, uh, which catches everyone by surprise, everybody of importance was away at their summer vacations. Borden was playing golf in the Muskokas, very reluctant to return to Ottawa from it. So at the outbreak of war, we have a situation where in Montreal, there are parades every night for the first few nights, much exaltation, uh, anger at the Germans, but Canadians, like people in Britain, had been, in a sense, prepared for war with Germany for some time because of the naval issue, the naval race issue. And that, of course, had been particularly important in Canada, where Borden's naval bill, following upon Laurier's so-called Tin Pot Navy bill, had educated the public to know that there was a major conflict with Germany looming, although there was no nothing in the summer of 1914 to indicate matters were getting worse. Indeed, if anything, the naval agreement was that, that was being forged between Britain and Germany on a de facto basis uh, was cooling tensions. So the, Austri the assassination of the Australian Archduke came out of at least a sunny blue sky, if not a clear blue sky. And uh, we are suddenly plunged into a situation where by August 30th, uh, the newspapers across Canada and in Montreal are talking about Armageddon, about God, what is going to happen next? Because everyone knows by then that the so-called blank check, which the Germans have issued, sorry, to, I didn't know it would do that, uh, to Vienna, uh, have created a situation where if Berlin is going to become part of the war, Germany become part of the war, then there's going to be a war because of 
France, Russia, the whole system of alliances will kick in. So um, there's an awareness of it, but basically in Montreal, people behave in a, in a, in a way that says war is a hell of a lot of fun. It's an adventure. We'll get it, it'll get us out of the recession of 1913, 14, that is pretty bad. Uh, the Black Watch, our Royal Highland Regiment are out first with their pipes wailing through the city. But even the French Canadian, that's a, take that back. The French Canadian Battalion, the 65th Carabiniere uh, uh, de Montréal, a march on the second night uh, through the east end of the city and then coming in towards the west end. And the crowds on the streets are raucous. Uh, crowds are reported to be gathering in various parts of the city to sing La Marseille and God Save the King and so on and so forth. That is the mood in Montreal without question. However, when it comes down to the nitty gritty, um, we are, I'll come back to this guy in a moment, when it comes back to the nitty gritty, the 1st Canadian Infantry Division, which will go overseas, and not to mention the 2nd Canadian Infantry Division, which is recruited in September, October 1914, turns out to be, in the case of 1st Division, 77% British born. Now, that's a quite remarkable situation. I wish Matt Baker was here because when he was doing his MA thesis and I was looking at his numbers, I said to him, my God, he, he is, we did a study of Chatham, Ontario, that in the first phase of the war, 80% of all of the volunteers from Chatham County came from 11% of the population that was British born. I didn't know that what I knew in Montreal had been so commonplace in other parts of Canada. I don't know of any other regional study, but to take, for example, the Irish, uh, sorry, the Scottish battalion, the the Royal Highland Regiment, um, the officers are all from the upper classes of Montreal, Canadian born, mostly totally inexperienced, but quite willing to be a major or a lieutenant colonel or even a lieutenant if forced down that low. But the number of ordinary Canadians from Montreal willing to join the army are very, very small. The second division is not quite as bad. It appears to be 68%, but I've never checked that number myself. And the 77% is a, is a shock, I think, should be to most Canadian historians. Um, the only battalion in maybe all of Canada that was an exception was the Royal Montreal Regiment, because the Royal Montreal Regiment was composed of four militia, sorry, Royal Montreal Battalion, was composed of four militia regiments, which included uh, the 65th Carabiniere de Montreal. So the 280 of the recruits were born in Canada because they were French Canadians. And they had to learn very quickly how to speak English and follow orders in English because none of the hierarchy of the Royal, what would be called the Royal Montreal Regiment, the 14th Battalion, uh, was able to converse in French in an effective way. All the drill books were in English, needless to say. There were no translation of even orders into uh, marching orders uh, for drill into French. So what we have, and I've used this phrase in the book a number of times, uh, what we have is a British army raised in Canada. I want to stress this as hard as I can. Um, H.P. Ames, who ran the Canadian Patriotic Fund, uh, and who uh, was uh, uh, actually American born himself, but had been in Canada for a very long time, American educated, um, said at a recruiting meeting in early 1915, we take great pride in what Canada is achieving in this war, but the reality is apart from officers, this is a British army. And, and that was an apt description particularly in Montreal, where so many of the soldiers who volunteered were in fact transient Brits who'd come to Canada to work on the railway or to take up farming and now found themselves back in Montreal because of the recession of 1913-14, which collapsed all railway and much manufacturing in the city. So we gotta be careful what we mean by the uh, 
Uh, I always remember when I was discussing this with my former, my friend, the late Roman Yaramovich, who wrote a history of the Black Watch. I, he said, well, it doesn't matter because the officers were Canadian and that's the only ones the British got to interact with. I said, well, that's, that's one view of the, of the reality of life in the First World War. Um, switching to Ireland, hmm? Switch to Ireland quickly. That's John Redman on a poster, uh, because just as the Irish in Montreal were keen and ready to go to war, indeed, they immediately created a new militia battalion, the 55th, sorry, there I go again, a new militia regiment, the 55th Irish Canadian Rangers, which were not activated, they're simply a militia regiment, uh, they created it in August. But in Ireland, um, our friend John Redman, who's pictured here in this cartoon poster, has decided two things. He's decided to allow the British government to postpone the implementation of the promised home rule, which was supposed to take place in 1914. And he has urged all Irishmen, south or north, to join together to fight for what? Well, that's an interesting question because, and I'll be very quick about this because I'm fascinated by it. One of the great forgotten figures of the early part of the First World War is the Cardinal Primate of Belgium, Cardinal Mercier, who at 1914 is famous everywhere because Mercier himself is in Rome for the election of the new Pope, Pope Benedict XV, when Belgium is invaded. And in order to get back to Belgium, he comes out through France and to London. And in London, he and our friend John Redman hold a joint rally under the theme that will keep coming back to us in this discussion, small nations must be free. And they're going to do this in the context of an enormous endorsement of the Irish population of London and Liverpool and Glasgow and Manchester for the unity of all Irishmen joining in this war, which everyone at the time believes is being fought for the most idealistic of reasons with regard to the German invasion of Belgium. Terry, here you go again, but just a parenthesis. Mercier is extraordinary. He issues pastoral letters condemning the Germans when he's back in Belgium, when he's back in Malin, where his sea is, and continues to be a figure of resistance. And uh, he uh, has a special connection, of course, with Ireland, but also with Canada. He visits Canada at the end of the war, where he is welcomed in Quebec City and Montreal and Toronto in a, in a very powerful way. One last word about Ireland, and then we'll go back to. Canada. Um, um, by the end of 1914, have mobilized and recruited three full divisions, the 10th and 16th, which are South Ireland, whatever you want to call it, not Ulster. And then the Ulster volunteers, to a man virtually, form the 36th Ulster Division. And uh, throughout the rest of the war, Ireland's task will be from a relatively small population base to find the recruits in order to sustain these divisions, which begin fighting in 1915. And of course, most famously fight in the Battle of the Somme where the Ulster Division and the 16th Division, yeah, 16th, the 10th is in, in the Balkans. Uh, are, are side by side in the endless um, quagmire, death and destruction of the sun. So we might want to remind ourselves of that too, because Kent struggling at that stage, having uh, recruited two divisions and is beginning to get organized about the possibility of the third division, uh, while Ireland has mobilized in this remarkable way that is largely a lost uh, to much of history. So all of this begins to change. Uh, I'm using the title mobilizing in Canada, uh, but it doesn't begin to change in any significant way until April 1915 and the Battle of the Ypsalient. 
I put up two pictures here, and I'm going to be, I'm not going to lecture on the Battle of the Ypsalian, fascinating as it is. I'll simply remind you that um, the third, the first Canadian division was moved into the Ypsalian uh, less than three weeks before uh, the counterattack began, uh, that the third Canadian infantry brigade, including the two Montreal battalions, 13th Black Watch, 14th Royal Montreal Regiment, were placed on the left-hand side of the uh, their part of the salient because the next division over was a French-Algerian division, the 45th French Division, and their officers spoke French, and it was hoped, and correctly so, that there were enough uh, Canadians in the 3rd Brigade uh, to converse with the French, and therefore it was easy to coordinate between the uh, Montreal battalions and the uh, and the uh, Algerian division, as you know, I'm sure, this was not necessarily a happy solution in terms of the survival of lives. Guy Drummond is pictured in the uh, trenches, and this is a very typical Montreal story. The Drummond family, his dad, is the president of the Bank of Montreal. Uh, he himself is a young man of parts. He has uh, is fluently bilingual, is a member of the Alliance Francaise, which is the organization of French people in Canada, organization, uh, and of the Literary Club in Montreal. He's an interesting guy. Uh, he um, marries uh, shortly before going overseas. Uh, his wife is pregnant in, uh, in April 1915. And Trump, one of the men, there are a number of others that I won't go into and mention in the book, uh, who are part of as after the Germans released the chlorine gas against the 45th French, the Algerian division on our left, which takes the brunt of the gas attack. And then of course withdraws, withdraws runs in panic as they are choking to death, um, exposing the entire Canadian left flank all the way back to saint -Gen. Yeah, So uh, Drummond and his friends and the large numbers of people in the Black Watch die in the next uh, 24 hours uh, in being overrun by the Germans, uh, catching the relatively less intense waves of gas, uh, finding themselves without equipment or supplies. And uh, again, being very quick, 6,000 Canadians are killed or wounded in the space of a week in the Battle of the Ypres Salient. And uh, the news reaches all Canadian cities, I'm sure, but in Montreal, it reaches it in a way which is particularly uh, awful, I suppose, because proportionately no one suffered heavier than the Black Watch, except perhaps the poor battalions asked to attack Kitchener's Wood, which I won't go into. Terry, be calm. Um, the, uh, the, the, the reality is that in Montreal, the newspapers begin story after story after story. Any sense that censorship worked in the early stages of something historians have invented because the reality is the graphic descriptions of what chlorine gas does to you, graphic descriptions of the people dying uh, of their, you know, et cetera. Okay, don't go further. Um, let's simply say this. The news is shocking and immediately forces people to react in some way. That's followed almost immediately by the sinking of the Lusitania. Now, the sinking of the Lusitania is a complex story, and I'm not going to go there except to say the evidence on the whole shows that the Germans only fired one torpedo. And the chances are the reason that the Lusitania exploded and sank, which surprised the hell out of the German U boat captain was that the, 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 the Lusitania had cut back on the number, of, or passengers had cut back on the number of people willing to risk the German threats to ships like the Lusitania, and a number of the holds were empty and coal gas had leaked into them. So the torpedo exploded the coal gas is the best known assumption. Well, Montreal uh, was in shock, maybe even more by the Lusitania than by what happened at Second Ypres because so many prominent families were affected in the city. And whether you like it or not, prominent families matter. There are names that people have heard in the newspapers before, and they are uh, 
Um, well, let me read this. Montreal was still mourning the men lost in Belgium when a German U-boat sank the Lusitania. A debate over the circumstances surrounding the loss of the Cunard liner and her 1,153 passenger and crew who drowned, it's a very large number, began almost immediately and has continued for 100 years. The German consulate in New York had, had warned Allied ships sailing into a war zone that they were liable to be attacked. And after the Lusitania was torpedoed, Britain declared, Berlin declared the ship was armed and carrying am ammunition and was therefore a legitimate target. The ship was not in fact armed, but was carrying war material. In 1915, few people in the Allied or neutral nations cared about such issues. What mattered to them was the terrible loss of civilian lives men, women, and children. The city's English language newspapers outdid each other in describing the most stupendous act of piracy in human history. Answer to Prussian treachery, they said, was to recruit more volunteers to serve overseas. With headlines like, world will hate the baby killers more than ever, and awful scenes as Lusitania sank with passengers, the Gazette and Star, the two daily newspapers, three, but the Gazette and the Star, and the Herald uh, provided detailed coverage of the fate of Montague Allen, the Allen Shipping Line's um, daughters, um, Anna and Gwen, 15 and 16, who were with their mother and the family maids when the Lusitania sank beneath them. The Allen girls were lost when suction from the ship's sinking drew them under. Gwen's body was recovered, but Anna's was never found. Lady Allen suffered serious injuries, but she and her two maids, Annie Waller and Emily Davis, were saved. Dorothy Braithwaite, who is on her way to London to join her two, her two sisters, who were the wives of two of the officers killed at Second Eep, and she was going over to join them for moral support, I guess, um, uh, who was on her way to London to join her two sisters, widowed at Second Deep, was with the Allens, and she too was drowned, as was her 18-month-old grandson, Herman, Herman Nurse. The story of the survival of Herbert Holt's teenage son, Holt was a very prominent Montreal businessman, known and not loved by everyone, um, but Robert Holt, who was all of 15, was said to have given his life jacket to a woman before swimming for an hour towards the Irish coast, which could be seen. Uh, and uh, Robert survived it. Uh, he was on the boat in order to go back uh, to Eton uh, or to go to family and then to Eton in the summer. Um, and then the next paragraph begins, the city had barely crossed these events when the reinforced Canadian division drawn from reserves in London was devastated again in the battle at Fistivere. Um, all of this is important because I've done the statistics pretty carefully, or at least Alec Mavara, my um, co-author or assistant for this book, and uh, other students from the center have done the statistics very carefully. Everything changed after uh, April, May, 1915, and the Canadian recruits came in very large numbers in late 1915 and in the first half of 1916. And there seems to be a direct correlation. In other words, the response, instead of the horror of war, I'm staying home, the response was to join and participate in uh, getting after the horrible enemy. Well, The authorized strength of the Canadian Expeditionary Force rose from 150,000 in 1915 to 250,000 by the end of that year. And then, of course, many of you will know that Borden issued his New Year's pledge saying that we would have a half million men in the Canadian Army. Borden is not a person who impresses me personally for a bunch of reasons I won't go into, but at the very least, you have to wonder what in hell he was thinking. Did he mean an army that's strong as 500,000? Where, you know, the Canadian Expeditionary Force never gets to be bigger than 180. 
So uh, what was he thinking? Or did he mean that in total, we're going to recruit 500,000 people? And how and when and under what circumstances, nobody knew. So nevertheless, it's true that by late 1915, early 1916, 1,000 men a day are enlisting. They're still about 50% British. But as time passes, that number sinks down into the 40s. Um, and we have a situation that matters to us in that the Irish community in Montreal argues successfully with Sir Sam Hughes, that redoubtable Orangeman, that uh, the Irish Canadian Rangers must become not a militia regiment, but an overseas battalion of the Canadian Expeditionary Force. So the 55th is transformed into the 199th. They're still the Irish Canadian Rangers, and they still have as their commanding officer Harry Flip Trier, or Henry Trier QC, who has absolutely no military experience, unless you think hockey is a good background, and I'm not so sure it isn't. Um, at any rate, he and his officers, who are equally uh, untrained, uh, are, uh, I can't say they're incompetent since we'll never know, uh, are sort of the Irish community's equivalent of the Spanish officer class. Uh, so now, now we have to go about the process of raising Irish Canadians of Protestant or Catholic origin uh, to join the 199th Battalion, uh, which is authorized in November 15th, but does not begin official recruiting until April the 24th, 1916, which is the date of the beginning of the Easter Rising in Dublin the Irish Rebellion. So while we're waiting to talk about that, we have to say that all that really happened in the first months of 1916 is that the soldiers who volunteered for the 55th Regiment transferred to the 199th Battalion, and the, therefore the first 500, it's hard to tell, uh, one of the students here at Laurier did a careful examination of all of the personnel files of the of the regiment and division, and there are simply too many cases where the indication isn't clear enough as to whether they'd been a member of the 55th or they just are ready. Anyway, you don't need to know. You don't need to go into that. That was one of those methodological issues we discussed among our student group uh, throughout the preparation of the uh, first phase of this particular book. At any rate, what we know is that the process began before April 24th, and so we have to use April 24th as a dividing role in order to gauge the Canadian reaction to the Easter Rebellion of 1916. The rebellion, because it is so fascinating, we could be here for quite a long time. Um, okay, Easter Rebellion, April 1916, it lasted six days. It involved the um, seizure of the post office in the center of Dublin uh, on what is today O'Connell Street, as well as uh, digging in at St. Stephen's Green. Does anybody know Dublin besides me in the room? No, all right. I won't go further then. A series of positions were taken over, and uh, it's extremely difficult to cut through the patriotic crap because what the hell are they doing? I mean, what do you think is going to happen if you grab hold of the post office and Patrick Pierce stands on the steps of the post office and reads a proclamation declaring the independence of the Irish Republic and then goes back inside? Well, you know, what happens is, is the British Army employing for the most part regiments of the British Army in Ireland who are largely Irish recruits to the British Army begin taking care of these outposts. And uh, they bring a gunship up the Liffey and it shells the post office, as well as given the inaccuracy of both naval and other artillery, a good deal of the rest of the center of Dublin, while the British bring up artillery and while well, each of these positions is reduced until on the 29th of April, Pierce surrenders. Uh, one could explore this endlessly. These are the two leaders of the uh, of the um, 
of the post office, part of the, of the uprising, Patrick Pierce. Pierce is an interesting chap, a dedicated uh, Roman Catholic, uh, as a pious Roman Catholic, a person deeply involved in the attempt to revive Earth or Gaelic, if you prefer, as a language. In 1914, he's almost completely unknown. He's teaching and is the principal of a St. Hilda's, a school which is teaching the Irish language and trying to create a generation of Irish patriots. Couldn't be as different from James Connolly as possible. Uh, Pierce is often seen as the figurehead in Connolly as the heart of the uprising. Connolly is a Marxist socialist syndicalist leader who in 1913 led the Irish worker out on a strike in Dublin, which uh, involved almost three months, a battle I might mention between the Irish Catholic working class and the Irish Catholic bourgeoisie, rather than anything to do with the British. Uh, and Connolly has equipped himself in 1913-14 with a private army of uh, 200 well-trained soldiers, and they're the ones who do most of the fighting, inflicting most of the casualties. We better also just go forward quickly to mention, no, I just buggered that up. Okay, um, not casement yet, I'll come back to casement. Constance Markovitz is, despite her last name, Irish, married to a Polish count, that's where the Markovitz come. But this picture is particularly interesting. Women participated openly and actively and with guns in the rebellion and the uprising. But um, Connie was the first one well before Easter 1916 to design her own uniform and get a picture taken in photo studios, some holding a weapon, some like this one. Uh, uh, and, and needless to say, uh, Constance Markowitz is a feminist, a suffragist, an activist. She's also the first woman to become elected to the British House of Commons in 1918. The first woman to become a cabinet minister in the in any government in the government of Ireland after uh, the treaty, which we better not go to, Terry. Okay, um, so basically, uh, what we have to do, and then we'll go on, is. Uh, 66 of the uh, rebels, if you wish to call them that, patriots if you prefer, were killed and later 16 executed for treason. Um, and uh, that was in the context of 143 British slash Irish soldiers killed, 397 wounded, 266 civilians killed in the crossfire, 2,200 2, wounded. Um, and uh, it, it, clearly, the civilians suffered far and away the most casualties in the context of the fighting that took place in Dublin. So we should never think, if we ever think about the Irish uprising, as something you know that happened as an incident. It was a bloody battle in the streets of Dublin and is remembered in that particular context. I also need to say that uh, uh, the Irish Parliamentary Party and John Redmond supported the British authorities throughout the uprising regarded the uh, uprisers as um, out of their skull. Roger Casement um, is a, a complicated case. And uh, again, I have to be very careful. Casement is the only one of any of these people who's an international figure. Casement has revealed the horrors of the Belgian Congo in a report to the British government, which is one of a knighthood as Sir Roger. He then the rest of the British government did a similar study of the fate of indigenous workers in Peru in the rubber industry uh, that actually uh, almost was as horrific as that, which was experienced by the people of the Belgian Congo. And his, uh, his position as an international, whatever you wish to call it, humanitarian reporter, I guess, uh, the, the rational scholarly equivalent of Joseph Conrad and uh, the book Heart of Darkness, uh, is also an Irishman, Irish Protestant, as so many of them were, uh, and a Republican. But he has come to the conclusion, even before the war, I might mention, that um, uh, Britain's danger is Ireland's opportunity. And he travels to the United States in order to raise money and then 
travels to Germany via Norway. Fight with hopefully Germans who will join with the Southern, the, the, the Southern volunteers and overthrow the British in Ireland. Now, Casement is not in close touch uh, with the IRB and certainly not with James Connolly. And I'm not sure, I have to be careful because Casement has become such a hero uh, for the most part uh, that uh, he's, he's almost untouchable. But I'm not sure that, that Connolly and uh, others uh, in, in the movement would have regarded him as simply a wild card outlier. At any rate, he arrives in Ireland in a German U-boat, comes ashore, British intelligence fully aware of his movements. The British arrest him. He hasn't brought the Irish brigade because no one among the Irish prisoners of war has chosen to volunteer. And the Germans don't think sending arms in any quantity or seriousness is worth doing, never mind sending German troops. So Casement arrives, is arrested, and joins the others uh, of the uh, total that I gave you before, uh, who were uh, prisoners. They're, actually, I didn't give it to you before. Over 1, 000, almost 2,000 are uh, sent to internment or prison in the aftermath of the war, mainly in Wales. Uh, and Casement is one of them. But he's and rises to a new level of, uh, of uh, whatever you wish to call it, treason, I guess. Uh, by attempting during a time of war to raise an Irish brigade. So Casement is a special treatment case. And um, in Canada, keep it as simple as I can, there's no really strong reaction that is pro-Republican to what is happening in Ireland. The hold that the Redmonds still have over public opinion in English-speaking Canada, certainly in Irish Montreal holds, on the whole, people believe that Casement and uh, the other rebels are crazy or outliers, et cetera. Well, life then becomes more complicated. Sorry, I, ah, there we go. The exception to it, I'm gonna sit down for a minute, guys. And just grab that, I'd appreciate it. Some of you may know that I finished my talk in Guelph last week in a spectacular fashion uh, by fainting. So uh, I have a series of health problems, which I think are under control. Uh, and I'm certainly not having any trouble tonight, but I promised myself as a precaution that I would take it a little bit easy towards the latter part of the talk. So reaction in Montreal to the rising is. Uh, fairly calm. French Canadians, however, in 1916, uh, French Canadian nationalists, and the nationalist part of French Canada, it would be fair to say, is growing in size and strength and passion, uh, finds itself uh, willing to use the casement trial and execution um, in order to promote the notion of the, I suppose, what you might call it a swanging match or the constant attacks on French Canada for not doing enough in the First World War. So the Nationaliste, the weekly edition of Le Devoir, publishes this cartoon comparing the hanging of Roger Casement uh, to the hanging of Louis Riel. And Jean Baptiste is asking himself what this means for French Canada, what the parallel means. I might say that the Toronto Globe, which is certainly not regarded as French Canadian, as an editorial writer known as Lindsay Crawford, a very interesting man who tried to create a more reasonable orange order in Ireland before emigrating to Canada, is an editorial writer for the Globe. And he too, he doesn't do anything like Rio and Casement, but he does argue a, a rational organized case for clemency for uh, uh, a casement on the, on the question of the future if you will, pacification of Ireland. And Crawford's stuff is published in Le Devoir, the French Canadian Nationalist Daily, but also in Le Canada, La Patrie, and uh, other uh, organs of public opinion in Quebec, 
So people know about the argument about casement. They know about the argument about the executions, particularly the execution of James Connolly, which many of you may know. Connolly was wounded during the fighting at the post office and was in a situation where in order to be executed by being shot, they tried to stand him up in a stretcher because he couldn't get out of the stretcher. And when that didn't work, they tied him to a chair to shoot him. And that did not make neutral, non-emotional press coverage of any particular kind. What has all this got to do with the Irish Canadian Rangers? Well, the poor buggers have got to try and move from a battalion which has 400 to 500 people from the 55th into a battalion which can go overseas and actually fight under its own officers, which is the promise to all the battalions being recruited across Canada, shows how impossible it all was, um, if they can recruit to full strength. So the Irish Canadian Rangers go through a process in 1916, uh, in June, July, August, September, October, November, when it, you have to fish or cut bait. Um, and the best posters that come out of the First World War are posters from 1916 for the Irish Canadian Rangers, of which these are two examples. Come with the Irish Canadian Rangers, overseas battalion, join the Irish Canadian Rangers, leap ahead. It goes on and on. Probably no battalion in the Canadian Expeditionary Force had better or more highly organized publicity and recruiting than the Irish Canadian Rangers in those four months of 1916. And it has to be said first that lots of people came forward from the Irish community in Montreal, but a minimum of one in three, and it may have been 50%, could not pass the physical exam. The problem of dental, vision, malnutrition, size. It's true that the army had reduced, you know, you didn't have to be 5'3 anymore. And indeed, once they allowed people under 5'3 to enlist, it isn't clear where the number was. Certainly, a lot of five-footers made it into the army in the aftermath. And the Canadian Dental Corps was invented to treat people, to cut down on the possibility of that being, and people were allowed to come into the army and get glasses. Uh, so all kinds of efforts were made. The Irish Canadian Rangers are trying to make themselves into a kind of elite battalion. They want the fittest men. I want to say one other thing about their struggles to create a battalion in 1916. All across Canada, uh, recruiting has dried up. After June 1916, people are saying, I ain't going to study war no more. I want to say this because it's before the sum. After the sum, recruiting will drop off in late 1916, early 1917 to create the context in which Borden will develop the demand for conscription. But again, we can do that another day. What we have before we leave the French Canadian thing completely is that a curious attempt to adopt the Irish by French Canadians takes place in 1916 and has continued through to the present day. There's a very interesting book called Le Vert et le Bleu, uh, which attempts to link closely the Irish and French Canada, in this case, the Irish in Ireland. And uh, it has a chapter on the Irish Canadian Rangers, which I've said very politely, is not based on the best evidence, but it's nevertheless an interesting chapter which introduces as historical memory, the possibility that there will be a, a connection between the experience of Ireland and the experience of French Canada. In other words, if Ireland can separate from the British Empire, can Quebec separate from the Canadian Empire? So, what we have is a situation where after all of these volunteers are rejected, the Irish actually have to go and get a pin made. To, people can have a pin that indicates they volunteered and been rejected. So they're not stopped on the street again. I want to use a quick parallel, very, very quick. The Canadian Grenadier Guards, a Montreal regiment, which already has a battalion, a famous battalion overseas, the 87th, tries to recruit at the same time. And their history says, 
that they were able to find um, 2,000 fit and able men, 2,500, pardon me, fit and able men were contacted by the recruiters of the Canadian, Canadian Guards. 1,200 agreed to a medical examination. 490 were taken on strength. But by the time the Canadian Grenadier Guards 245th Battalion sailed, there were only 245 left. Now, that's an interesting comment to make because where the hell did they go? Well, they walked away, is the reality. And exploration of AWL is, a, is an issue that you know, people have simply not addressed in a, in a serious way. So what the Irish have by contrast is 860 men by November, which is not 1,100 where they're supposed to be, but it's better than the Canadian Grenadier Guards had done. And um, so they think they're ready to be inspected prior to being sent overseas to join the active forces of the Canadian Expeditionary Force. Make again a complicated story. Short General Lassard arrives to inspect the battalion and uh, this is developed in somewhat more detail in the book, but basically 300 of the 860 men aren't present that day. And only 66 are officially classified as AWL. Well, adjutants get to decide at what point you are AWL or at what point you're gonna come back, you're just a bit late. Um, and, and nobody that I know of knows what the hell was happening but Lassard um, is, to put it mildly, totally unimpressed with the Irish Canadian Rangers. He says Trie is a very nice man, very prominent and, and a good leader, but has absolutely no military experience and no capacity to train anyone. Neither does his 2IC. The adjutant of the regiment, <coughs> one of Lord Shaughnessy's sons, is again, uh, you know, the best of the best blood of Canada, all that kind of stuff one talks about, and doesn't have the slightest idea of how to be an adjutant of a regiment. He says the men are healthy, but totally untrained and fit only for drafts. Now, this is a long way from the dream of the Irish Canadian Rangers <laughs> to take their place in the front. So, um, when they're in Canada, who knows what would have happened if it had not been the, for the intervention of Boner Law, the Canadian-born colonial secretary, who urges them to come to Ireland first before going to Aldershot or, or wherever it is they're going to be trained and do a tour of Ireland as part of a British propaganda effort. And um, again, Almost everyone, including my friend, the late Robin Burns, who wrote the first article on the Irish Canadian Rangers, uh, drew my attention to the issue many years ago, has got this wrong. Um, the British military would have nothing to do with it. Either the battalion was coming in the next available draft or not. And it was in Canada, in Ottawa, that Doherty, Trehay, and the Irish of Montreal demanded the opportunity to go to Ireland and tour themselves. So the British gave in, politics won out over the military, and the Irish set sail not for England to train to go to France, but for Ireland to do a public relations tour. When Trehay found this out, he resigned his lieutenant colonelcy. And during the tour of Ireland, we have a situation where uh, the Irish have to be revised in order to uh, put it together. And, um, I'm almost done, so I'll keep it as simple as I possibly can. Um, they bring in a soldier who is a, from a prominent Irish family who was part of the 55th Battalion briefly, but who volunteered in 1914 with the Royal Montreal Regiment, then served with the 60th Battalion, another story that I've left out, and uh, won the DSO in action. Uh, a six foot four, uh, very, very strong personality. And he and a new 2IC, who's also a veteran, take over the Irish Canadian Rangers and will later train them. But in the meantime, they're going to lead them on a tour of Ireland. So um, it turns out that 
only 700 men make the voyage. So I'm not sure where we got from 860 down to 700. And I'm not sure why historians ignore that because almost all of the battalions are going over or having the same problem. So if the Irish Canadian Rangers are to be a frontline battalion, political influence will have to be brought to bear again and reinforcements will have to be found uh, before the training can begin. Well, anyway, the tour begins in late January, 1917 and all across Ireland, touring Ireland, I've called it, in the center of the lines are the Irish Canadian Rangers, the 700 men. Uh, this is Cork, but they go to Limerick, uh, to Dublin, to Armagh, and of course to Belfast. And everywhere they are treated like visiting royalty. Why is a question that <clears throat> raises a whole, whole bunch of issues, because January 1917 is getting on for eight months after the Easter Rising. And the Irish have already, the Irish Republicans have already won two important by-elections, which have brought Sinn Féin into power, at least in the minds of Sinn Féin. The Irish Parliamentary Party is still, of course, appears to be totally dominant, but John Redmond and other members of the Irish Parliamentary Party urge all of Ireland to engage with the Canadian troops as they march. I asked my Uncle Dougie if he and my dad went to see them when they marched through Dublin, and he didn't recall. He said, sort of, the two of them, they had, by the way, been orphaned when my dad was only four. So the two boys in Ireland probably did go to see the parade, but neither of them remembered it for various reasons. Matt wanted me to show this picture, particularly in front of Cork City Hall, because he says that's a Canadian ensign flying over Cork City Hall. I can't see it is. I don't know if any of you can. But Matt was, of course, able to blow it up. And maybe he's, I'm sure he's right. We don't see many red ensigns in the First World War at this stage. So the Dublin reception includes visits with the Irish Catholic bishops, endorsations by Protestant leaders, and of course, Belfast, the Ulster treat them again well. So the trouble is, of course, that um, the Irish Canadian Rangers have not met the criteria to become a battalion of the Canadian Expeditionary Force, and therefore they are headed for the Reserve Battalion, our Reserve Division, pardon me, and they're going to be replacements fed into the stream. Except back in Ottawa, the Irish are able to muster the support, obviously, of C.J. Doherty, but also of Robert Borden, and get to Boner Law, who gets to Lloyd George, who gets to, you know, the way politics goes. So the Irish are given a reprieve, and they become part of the 5th Canadian Division, which is training in anticipation of being able to go overseas. All of this, of course, will end with the introduction of conscription. As again, the connection is really interesting. The British government introduces conscription from Ireland, which has been exempt from conscription up until that point after the German offensive of March 1918. And, the, and Ireland, too, will have to provide conscripts after March of, the, of, uh, of 1918. Well, Canada, of course, the cancellation of exemptions, which really transforms the situation in Quebec from one of quiet resistance to one of open resistance is uh, also March of 1918. So Harry Trier speaks up on behalf perhaps of the Canadian Irish in uh, uh, July actually of 1918 after the conscription campaign is well underway. And he says, the Irish Canadian realizes what he has formerly heard but does not appreciate that Ireland is under martial law and is occupied by an English army. He reads in the press that English soldiers were in Dublin and Cork with rifle and machine guns. The Irish Canadian believes Ireland to be a nation worthy of freedom. He wonders if the conscription of 100,000 Canadians would still be necessary if the 150,000 men comprising the English army in Ireland were sent to fight in France. He wonders where Can Canadians may best maintain the war purpose vital to Canada. 
small nations must be free. If conscription becomes law, of course, Irish Canadians will loyally observe the law for they are Canadians. The Irish Parliamentary Party will try the same argument in Ireland throughout 1917 during what is known as the Irish Convention, but the election of December 1918 will sweep them out of existence and bring Sinn Féin to power, and of course will begin the process, which we are not going to go into tonight, under any circumstances, at least a question demands it, to the troubles that will preoccupy Ireland in 1918, 1920, 21, 22, and 23, when things are finally overcome. Thanks very much for your attention. I really appreciate it. Well, Terry, thank you very much for a wonderful set of remarks. Um, it's been a, the project has been a long one, um, I know, and it's just so much fun to see um, how it's evolved over time. I think we talked about it maybe four or five years ago downstairs in the podcast studio. Um, and now to see it in, in full book form is, is something else in the story of the Irish Canadian Rangers in it um, is, a, is a, a remarkable one and I'm sure a special one for you and your family as well. Um, so, of course, we have time for questions this evening. Um, what we're going to do is, since we have both an in-person and a virtual audience, um, is we're going to give um, the chance for the in-person audience to ask questions first. Um, so we're going to do two in-person questions, and then we're going to come back and I'm going to pose a virtual question, and then we're going to go back again to the to the live audience here um, and just kind of rotate back and forth from there until we wrap things for up. For a little while. Yeah. Yes, just for a little while. We will be, We I think we're already at 20 after 8, so we'll maybe go for 15 minutes or so, 15 yeah. or 20 minutes. Um, and uh, yeah, so why don't we start with um, some questions uh, here in the room. Um, if anyone has a question, please uh, please raise your hand. There are the two, three. Thank you, Dr. Kopp. Good to see you in person. Um, d d this is, you mentioned the Lusitania and, and what little I know of the Lusitania had sailed from New York. There were warnings from the Germans and just off the coast of Ireland, it, it gets sunk. I was not aware there were so many Canadians on board. Did the ship uh, see port in Canada on the way over and that accounts for it? No, people. or people of wealth and their servants, maids, nurses, et cetera, traveled to New York to catch the Lusitania. Lusitania was the most famous ship in the world after the Titanic went down and it would be the Canard Liner's choice for, would be the choice of the Canard Liner for going overseas. And everybody believed nobody could sink a ship that big. Um, and you know the, the mystery of its sinking is a, is a real issue. At the time, as I said, nobody cared. They just thought the stories of what had happened to the 1,100 passengers and crew, men, women, and children, was so horrific coming after the chlorine gas attack, which people could not imagine. They, they read about it, but they couldn't imagine that. Uh, but Fritz Haberer and the German scientists who organized it believed they were shortening the war. Uh, they genuinely believed that. They thought that it uh, would allow a breakthrough to occur and uh, in the long run lives would be saved. Mm -hmm. Everything about war as we know today is so unpredictable that anybody who thinks they know what's happening in the Ukraine or anywhere else is just wrong. We just don't know what's going to happen next. Sorry. Did Harry Trier have a subsequent military career? No, the Irish Rangers sort of gave up in the 1920s, one of the massive reorganizations of the Canadian Army. Uh, Harry um, went back to being a lawyer and a prominent lawyer in interwar Montreal. Uh, and one of, one of the many things that is difficult to understand is that the Irish in Montreal, I won't say they gave up on Ireland after the Troubles, the Anglo-Irish War, the Civil War and you know the troubles of the of the early 1920s, but it's quite clear that the there's a very different relationship with Ireland. I think throughout Canada after the the First World War than there was before the war. 
There's still St. Patrick's societies. There's still green beer in Montreal, 17th, but it's a very different sense of, of identification. And uh, uh, Trier simply reabsorbed himself into the Anglo-Celtic community and had a prominent career, but not one specifically related to the Irish community. Thanks, Terry. Uh, the next question to you comes from Dave Alexander from oh, Owen okay. Sound. Hi, Dave. <laughs> uh, Dave has actually just published an article on Owen Sound uh, Collegiate in the Second World War, and it's just been published in the Canadian Military History Journal, the one we have here. So please do check it out. Um, but his question to you, Terry, um, is if you could comment on the value of using uh, historical newspapers in researching and writing Montreal at war and also in the context of tonight's talk on the Irish Canadian Rangers. Yeah, I used a lot of newspapers or I and my students used a lot of newspapers. Uh, we began with a th completely thorough examination of the Montreal Star, which was the big newspaper, largest circulation in Canada. Uh, in that period, except for La Presse, it's French Canadian. Montreal Star, together its weekly edition, The Standard, uh, went across Canada and you know was the equivalent of I don't know what. I don't think the Golden Mail of today is really as important as the Montreal Star was in those days. And uh, I've always distinguished, and I say that in the book, between uh, editorial and uh, and opinion commentary and news stories. Lord Athelstan, as he became during the war, Hugh Graham uh, made a lot of money out of the Montreal Star and he could afford to hire good reporters. And he could, for example, when a Montrealer was killed, send them out in that fashion to their family home to get the details and write an actual bio. So using this, the newspapers for historical purposes, if I wanna know the opinion of the Montreal Star, I can find it in the editorial page, but it's not particularly important to me because it's so predictable. They're pro-empire, they're pro conscript you name it. Uh, but that has little to do with the news. So if you concentrate on what happened and you concentrate on the context, I always ask myself and my student assistants to say, how important is this story? And uh, for example, I use the the, trial Roger Casement and compare it to the lack of attention paid to Henri Bourassa's reply to his cousin um, uh, Papineau, uh, which is for Canadian historians who often go back into the past with tunnel vision and don't care about what is happening around the particular event. They uh, the, the, very simply, uh, uh, Casement and a fire that burned all across Northern Ontario and still remains the most costly human fire with over 200 people killed in all of Canadian history are what the newspapers are interested in, in the era of the, uh, the Casement trial. But the Irish community is still deeply involved with Roger Casement. French Canadians are involved, I showed you that. And English Canadians are, I think, struggling to try and understand how this hero can now have become uh, this treasonous figure. But I think you can find that in the newspapers if you deal with events rather than simply opinion. So Dave, that's my answer. Any questions from the audience? Here, lots coming in online. My cousin a while ago, and I found out that her dad had won the military medal for valor. He was a Northern Irishman whose parents wanted him to become a Presbyterian minister, and he ran away and joined the army. So he went from the religious frying pan into the fire. He was in the first battle of the Somme, and out of the five, this is according to my cousin, his daughter, of the 500 men in his unit who went, in, went into battle that day, 13 at the end of the day were left alive and unwounded. He crawled through the mud with his friend on his back to the first aid post and found that his friend had died because he had two bullets in his back. But he was a Protestant Irishman who fought for the British army. Now, if he'd been Roman Catholic, would his life have been different? I wonder. 
Well, uh, if he was in Northern Ireland and a Roman Catholic, he might not have joined the Ulster Division because we find there were a relatively small number of Roman Catholics in the Ulster Division, but he could have easily gone uh, to Southern Ireland uh, and joined the 10th or the 16th. Um, so the, those of you, there are a few who've been on battlefield tours with me that include the First World War, now we always go to the Connaught Tower which is the, uh, the memorial to the Ulster Division, but which over time became the role of the two Irish divisions, the 36th Ulster Division and the uh, um, 10th, 16th, eh? 16th, eh? Uh, South Irish Division in the Battle of the Sun. And the great tragedy, of course, is the two divisions fought together uh, and, uh, they were the only divisions on the northern flank of the attack, right beside Beaumont and L and the Newfoundland, uh, who, who were successful. And the price of success was to be caught out in a deep salient and be counterattacked by the Germans, not from one side, the front, but from three sides. And the casualties to the Ulster Division were horrendous to the Southern Irish Division. So probability he was part of it as the, uh, as the 16th Division. But I, I, I can't go further than that. Harry, I just wanted to follow up from what you're talking about because when you're on the Psalm, you're always, it's all about memory and, and, and the uh, 36 Ulster Division Memorial and so on is so prominent. What is the memory in Montreal of the whole Irish story that you're presenting uh, back home? Well, um, a former student of mine, Robin Burns, who was a professor at Bishops and a colleague of mine for a while at Concordia and a personal close friend, um, wrote the first article. And I think up until then, that I can't remember the date of it, but it was while I was still in Montreal. So sometime in the 1970s, he gave a paper on it, and it's a very good paper. It just it didn't have the access to sources that we have today. The attestation papers weren't there and so on. Um, and he was the one who drew to it and drew the Irish community's attention to it, I guess. But I would say in the 1970s, nil, there was no memory whatsoever. Um, Montreal has become curious again. Concordia has an Irish studies center. Uh, and uh, there's much more attention paid uh, to speaking minority in general, its history, and within that, the Irish community. Therefore, a memory is being recreated. And uh, as I said, French Canada is also has historians trying to create a memory of the connection between French Canada and the Irish. So you know what the tricks of memory history are. Uh, historians ask new questions on the basis really of present preoccupations and concerns. In the case of the Irish in Montreal, they're afraid not only of losing the connection of, uh, of the Irish, they're afraid of losing their, their way of life, their existence in the city, particularly after Bill 96. Is there Post-war? Yeah. But the Irish never make it into, you know, those of you who don't know, sorry, they, under political influence, become part of the fifth division, but the fifth division is broken up after Arthur Curry argues, we're not going to put a fifth division in the field. We're going to use the men of the fifth division to strengthen the existing four divisions. And uh, uh, and the Canadian Corps becomes this super corps in 1918 as a consequence of that decision, and therefore gets the privilege of doing the heavy lifting all through the hundred days and suffering yet more casualties on a very large scale. Oh, I, 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 I'm okay. Sitting down is actually I don't know if anybody noticed, but I was having a little tr trouble with my right leg, which is another issue. So go ahead. Um, if you guys can stand it, the gentleman walked out quietly. If you want to leave, go ahead. 
my feelings <laughs> after uh, I've been doing this for 60, how long ago is 1959? Anyway, I've been a university university teacher since 1959. So I, 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 I you know, lots has happened. Yeah. Okay. And everybody wants to buy a book too, right? Oh yeah, darn right. Yeah. <laughs> um, question coming from Joel Watson. Hi, um, Joel. Goodness se me. Several of you will recognize that name. Um, he asks, why did they choose to be called the Rangers? It's a good question, and I don't know the answer. Tr Tree Hay seems to have been responsible, uh, so he should have wanted to call them the Irish Canadian Shamrocks. But uh, as far as I know, uh, the suggestion was made back in 1914 when the militia battalion was a militia regiment was created uh, to call it the Irish Canadian Rangers. There are such lovely Canadian militia regiment names all across the country that he didn't want to be called something simple. Uh, you know, the Canadian Army was uh, the CEF was becoming numbered battalions, which everybody uses, but the militia regiments remain both then and later, the Rocky Mountain Rangers, the Irish Canadian Rangers, the, you know, neat stuff that is supposed to be good for regimental pride. That's the best I can do, Joel. Um, I'll ask uh, maybe another question, maybe even a second from the audience um, on Zoom, because there are a number of questions that have come in. Um, this next question comes from Robert Young. Um, Terry, he, he knows that the Orange Order was active in Ontario, but were they also active in Quebec? Yeah, they were active in the sense that the Great July Day happens, uh, and uh, there is a um, Protestant equivalent of the St. Patrick Society called uh, the Irish Protestant Benevolent Society, um, and they. But there's no nothing like in Ontario. The Orange Order is toothless, or wishes to be non-confrontational in Montreal. Even as late as the 1950s, um, I, I say this personally, I actually remember as part of a young people's group at Wesley United Church going to visit the Orange Home, which was the Irish Protestant Orphanage and the Irish Catholic Orphanage St. Patrick's. I don't know what we were doing. I remember the events closely and I remember the uh, the Irish uh, Irish Protestant home for orphans, all the kids sang, we don't care for all the rest of Canada, all the rest of Canada, all the rest of Canada. We don't care for all the rest of Canada. We're from the orange home. <clears throat> so the only time I'll sing tonight, but that's stuck in my memory from particularly junior high school, it was actually a very moving experience. I had not been exposed to such institutions previously, and they were not places that you really wanted to have your child in. I think only one other person that I've seen has ever sung um, during their talk, and that was Tim Cook. Um, <laughs> I hope he has a better voice than I do. <laughs> I think you both were equally uh, ah, good. <laughs> Um, so this next question, then I'll pose it back to the in-person audience here. Um, this next question comes from Lily Kim, Terry. Um, she said, you mentioned the Ulster Scots had become part of the establishment in Canada. She wonders if this occurred as a result of the influence of Pennsylvania in the 19th century, and were they at all treated differently in the forces and in Britain before April 16? A little bit confused by Pennsylvania. I don't know what that. I don't. Doesn't matter. Let me mm. just comment quickly. Um, if you have a, a elite of, uh, you know, maybe fifty millionaires in contemporary nineteen fourteen dollars in Montreal, uh, and it's the dominant city in Canada, it's the metropolis, it's the business capital, the railways, banks, manufacturing, etc and you find that maybe 10 of the 50 are Irish Protestants, might be 15 of the 50 are Irish Protestants uh, and rising, and a number are Irish Catholics, then you're talking about a community that has made it in not only into the lower middle class, like my parents uh, and my relations, 
or into the middle class, but have made it into the, the square mile and Westmount and the, and the glories of power and influence. So it would be inconceivable to really postulate anything other than the kind of affection for, for Irish, for Ireland, and for having your own institutions for Irish Catholics. Irish Protestants went to school with everybody else. But Irish Catholics in this curious way, the French Catholics did not want them in their schools because they were afraid of bilingualism, afraid of the impact of English language. So they allowed the, the Catholic School Board of Montreal, which was obviously a French Canadian institution, to set up a separate set of schools. And that kept the Irish Catholics, even in my youth in the city, I mean, Daniel O'Connell High School, which was part of our communities in NDG, uh, was uh, Irish Catholic. And, uh, you know, we played sports against, anyway, that kind of thing. That institutional separation kept them in existence until, uh, you know, the uh, English Catholic School Board and the Protestant Board disappeared in the 1990s and became the English School, that's what we have in Quebec today, uh, is the English School Board of Greater Montreal, which both Catholic and Protestants who have the right to go to an English language school go to. Are there any, any other questions from here in person? Well, that folks would like to ask. Okay, you let's just take, sorry, one or two more and then we'll call it a night. Uh, just curious, you were talking about all the prominent families in Montreal who participated in one way or another with the war effort with uh, dubious qualifications in some cases. Uh, I'm just wondering how many of them uh, got into harm's way? There was that one slide of one of the sons of you know a prominent family in, in a trench. Did many prominent families in Montreal lose a son uh, or a father and did it have any impact on, on public opinion or was it just a, a personal tragedy? I'm tempted to say this reminds me of the debt that I owed Adrian Gregory, whose book, uh, uh, The Last Great War, I used in a class here at Laurier and the students became so involved with it that I became involved with it. And it led to an attempt to write an equivalent book on the last great war in Canada and then I realized that that was an impossible task. And two of my really great students, um, um, students Jeff knows well, uh, Jeff Keelan and uh, Pat, uh, uh, Brendan O'Driscoll uh, studied Montreal, Henri Barras in the case of Jeff and um, Montreal social history in, during the war in the case of Brendan. And they drew me back to say, I said to myself one day, like, you know, why didn't I think of this before? I'm a Montrealer and I was a Montreal historian. Why don't I take the book and turn it into a study of Montreal, which I might be able to do rather than the notion of trying to spread it across Canada. So um, the, uh, the, there's no absolutely no question to answer what you're saying that a disproportionate number of prominent families lost sons. In 1915 and 1916, that had a deep impact if measured by religious services, sermons, articles in the newspapers about families. I have to say that one of the things that's fascinating about the war, it'd be nice to know if this is true in other cities, is that I think religion begins to lose its hold in the later stages of the war. I think that the message so many ministers are putting out that you're dying a heroic death, you're a Christ-like figure, uh, you, uh, you know, um, uh, I, I say in the book that, uh, to put this in its worst form, uh, the Christian doctrine is perverted to the point where ministers are saying that if your son dies in combat, he will immediately go to the right hand of God and be with Jesus Christ. And if you're a Presbyterian, that's particularly tough stuff because you're supposed to be saved, never mind, et cetera. Uh, but 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 it's amazing to watch the religious news in the newspaper shrink. I, I'll be tempted to say to keep it simple after the sun. And by 1918, the reporting in the Star and the Gazette and the Herald and the 
well, the press is another story. They never reported because the Catholics don't go through these endless sermons in which they're trying to explain the world. At least if they do, they're not reported in the newspapers. Um, but the newspapers do report a lot of sermons. And I would say that difference between late 1915 and late 1917 is day and night in terms of the, the centrality. But the deaths of the prominent people uh, don't end. I might say the same things too in Ireland. There's a very good study of the, um, of the Irish nobility and its casualties. And once again, officers die in disproportionately high numbers over other ranks. A junior officers in considerably disproportionate numbers over higher officer ranks. So the answer is yes, they died all over continuously. Don't, don't want to be a lieutenant in the, in the CEF or the BEF in the First World War. Your survival time is very limited. Well, I think that's actually a, a good place to stop. I don't want to keep people for too much longer. Um, but let's give Terry one more round of applause for a great presentation. Now, of course, as we always have, we have books available um, here. Terry has signed a number of them, and I'm sure we'll sign some more if we run out. Um, they're, they're usually available for $25, but we have them at a discount for 20 here. Uh, for those who are tuning in online, uh, we, have, uh, we have a discount code for you. I believe Matt Baker has already shared that with you in the chat. So please do um, follow the link that he has sent and enter in the discount code CONF2022, C-O-N-F 2022 for 25% off. Um, our next event is going to take place in about a month on the 27th of October at 7 o'clock p.m. Uh, a new faculty member here at Laurie Brantford is going to be giving a talk on her recent research on human trafficking in Canada. Um, I hope all of you can make it both, of course, in, in person, but also um, on Zoom. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you again very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Very good. Very good.